Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Alan, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? I don't have any adjustments. However, I have put at your seat, I sent this out to you today by email, but everyone has said they didn't get it. So I did bring an extra copy. This is on uh, classroom technology integrators, which I thought you might be interested in reading. But I do not have any changes to the agenda. I'm wondering if the letter, um, the letter that we talked about um, sending to Commissioner Gendron at a minimum about the GPA and the statement on the laptop is warrants, if we need to put that on. I don't think that's officially on the agenda, so I would suggest that that's an adjustment. Um, and I guess the letter would require a vote, so maybe we can make that 7G. Does that sound reasonable? Sure. Yeah. And I do have extra copies if anyone needs them. Okay. <laughs> I saw that look. Okay. Um, we have several minutes to approve. Um, Trish, can I yes. ask? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to speak about, give an update on SEEP. Did you want me to do that under the committee reports? Because Yeah, you can do that under the committee. Okay, great. Yep. And sports on right, exactly. Um, okay. The regular uh, meeting on Tuesday, March 10th. And I have a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second? Second. Thank you, Peter. All those, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? I think that's seven zero. Okay, the special meeting on Tuesday, March 24th. Um, and I have a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you, Karen. Um, second? So moved. Thank you, Peter. Any comments or questions or discussion? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, the third what meeting that we need to approve is Monday, April 6th, special meeting. Can I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. Second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Um, any comments or corrections? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Comments by our student representatives? Do we have any here? Come on up, if you wouldn't mind. Um, hi, I'm Lee Foden. Um, on, I'll update you on what's happening lately. On Friday, April 17th, there isn't any school. And there's a third annual middle school arts night on April 29th at 7 at the school. Um, the jazz band will be performing. They'll be drumming, selling of local artists and student work throughout the school. So this week is World Language Week. There's a trivia question every day and in the fifth grade, there's a guest speaker, Peter Filippa from Bulgaria. And in classes, there's listening to different music. And we're making a music tour poster from around the world. And we're saying the Pledge of Allegiance in different languages every morning. Um, and tomorrow in the high school, there's a fifth and sixth grade band and chorus performance at the high school gym at 7. The fourth dance of the year for the seventh and eighth graders is on May 1st from 7th to 9. And the sixth grade goes to Chiwanki May 4th to May 8th. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't see any high school students, so. Um, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board on non-agenda items? Would it be possible for me to address the board at the end of the meeting as opposed to the start of the meeting? Does anyone have any? Nope, that would no be objection. fine. No objection. That's fine. fine. I'll be here. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else um, <coughs> public who wants to comment on a non-agenda item? And I would ask that just remind them if they could be brief. I always get stuck in as I walk to the podium. Um, 
a, a simple observation and a request. The town council last night, uh, even though I didn't stay for the whole thing, uh, apparently uh, voted to toss back to you uh, about the 140 some odd thousand dollar problem. I have communicated to them my beliefs uh, early this morning in a fairly strongly worded email and throughout the day. And my belief is that I do not think we should uh, balance our budget on the backs of teachers and students. If we have a $145,000 hole, quite frankly, I think uh, those who gain, which are the taxpayers, should pay. And those who suffer the pain, i.e., uh, it should be those who gain who suffer the pain, the taxpayers. So whoever you wish to solve this problem, I am at least one taxpayer that's willing to pay for what I get. And uh, I believe that the vast majority of taxpayers will be willing to pay a 0.6% increase rather than have it come out of teachers. And I know a lot was said at that meeting about what teachers have made. Make. A lot of it seemed quite high to me, but I do not know the numbers to know whether it really is. Uh, it's the first time I ever heard that teachers make an awful lot of money. And I, so my basic point was to suggest to you, it's up to you how to handle it, but as a taxpayer, I'm willing to pay for it. Thank you, David. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. Recognition. Middle school drama club performance. I think we may have a few of them here, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it anyway. Steve, do you want to make some comments about it? I, I will just say it was an excellent performance, but you may want to talk about it for a few minutes for us. Well, th thank you very much. I, in all my years of uh, involvement with uh, the middle school and specifically with the middle school drama club, we've never been recognized formally anyway by the school board. So I wanted to really say thank you. <clears throat> To you folks for putting us on the agenda. On the agenda, um, uh, Evan, Mr. Solander, and I had a wonderful experience this year. We had not been involved in drama for a couple of years, uh, for me longer than he. And um, he's unfortunately involved in a, a semi-performance of his own tonight with his social studies groups at the middle school. He couldn't be here, um, so I speak for him when I say. Uh, it was a fantastic return to middle school drama. It is a really, truly uplifting experience. Um, and this cast and these community members, their parents, um, come together in a way that I just don't think you can find in any other, maybe another, any other middle school in Maine, and certainly in any other activity that we do as a middle school. It really brings together fifth through eighth graders and parents and uh, teachers who, um, and staff who wouldn't ordinarily sort of get behind something like this. So thank you again for your recognition. And uh, this show, we all still wake up singing the song. So <laughs> thank you. It was great. I had the pleasure of attending, and it was really terrific. And you're right. It's a tote, it was toe-tapping music, and everyone did a great job. It, it was my first middle school play, and I was um, taken aback by the quality of the staging, the costumes, the singing, the music. The, the production as a whole, it was astounding. Um, so congratulations to all of you. Thank you. And I would like to congratulate. <laughs> I would like to congratulate you, all, congratulate you also, both on the play, but another very important piece to this is to watch students who have come up from elementary school to middle school and the change in what they do, the maturity that they do with it, and I hope they are pr very proud of what they have done for the middle school in showing what you are capable of doing. I had many people who said, this could have been a high school play mm -hmm. with the way you did it. So I really appreciate that, and I hope that the people who have worked with you in the past, from kindergarten on the, all the way up through, have taken note of it, and have taken note of what a great job you have done and how you've grown into this piece. So thank you very much for what you've done also. Thank you. Okay, the AP government trip. Do we have any information on that, Jeff? Do you have anything you want to report or do we want to excuse you want to let them go? Oh. It, 
you, you, you middle school students, um, actors and actresses, are welcome to stay, but you may leave if you like. <laughs> I know a lot of high school people didn't come tonight because they had so much homework. I hope you're not yeah. in the same condition, but we'll see. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I don't have, you know. Just sort of really quickly, because I don't have anything prepared, I know that uh, <clears throat> Ted Jordan and uh, Ms. McNulty and her husband um, and some other chaperones went down and they took 30 students to Washington. I would say it was a very uh, successful trip. It's always an extremely busy trip. Um, the kids are busy from just about 8 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night uh, with various activities, wanderings, and um, I know some of the highlights this year, we're talking to a couple of lobbyists, talking to some former CAPOs with high school graduates who are now working on Capitol Hill. They had the rare privilege of actually going to the Senate um, at a time when all 100 members of the Senate were on the floor and actively working. I mean, that almost never happens, um, although C-SPAN makes it appear that there's more bodies than there really are sometimes. And the other one is, for the first time, um, they were able to go to the Supreme Court and actually sit down on a, in an actual oral argument, which is very um. difficult to sort of be able to get to do. It was a great privilege, and the kids enjoyed it. Um, I heard nothing but really positive reports from students about the trip. And I know if Ted were here, he would once again, as he always does, thank the board for your support. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Um, the State Jazz Festival. <laughs> My job. <laughs> <laughs> the kids did really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I honestly, the, the, um, I think each one of the combos received recognition. I think our main jazz ensemble took third place in the state ensemble. Um, there are a number of students, Luke Carey and some others, who received outstanding musician awards, and um, Brandon Meager, uh, and I think it was Luke and Brandon who received the highest recognition for all of the musicians who were from the Cape program. But it's, uh, we have an absolutely incredible thriving jazz program, um, and if anybody managed to get to see the jazz cabaret as well, the, the, a couple weekends, just a couple weekends ago, um, it's just a really amazing, it's a real jewel. Yes. It was with high school. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. I would echo your comments about the cabaret. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, the cabaret was awesome. Mm -hmm. And what was really nice was, um, well, Tom Lazotte's Tom commitment to those kids is just, he just exudes it. And those kids love it. Mm -hmm. They had a great time. And the one thing that was really nice was, um, Got to see the um, old and the young and the middle-aged, <laughs> but the room was filled. I mean, the kids sold drinks and desserts, and they had they brought, brought in some um, people from I can't remember one of the nursing homes, and then you had little kids running around and dancing and twirling, and it was just a really neat nice. community <coughs> um, project. So, um, you know, congratulations to Tom Lazat and his group and the, and the kids because they did a wonderful job. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Communications. Thank you, Kathy. Um, retirements, Al. No, I do have one on this. This does say retirements, but unless I have a surprise, I did read Julie's a couple of months ago. There's only one this time, and this is from Ellen Brady. And Ellen writes, please accept my letter of intent to retire from my position as a district teacher of English language learners. After almost 20 years working in the CAPE system and as a parent of three children who experienced the joy of the school system, it is very difficult to say goodbye. It has been an adventure, beginning as an ed tech at the high school, then as a special education teacher in the middle school, finally as an English as second language teacher while supporting math with Pond Cove students. Flexibility and a sense of humor have helped, but truly, the wonderful students, staff, and parents have facilitated my career path into, remark into a remarkable journey. Thank you for the opportunity to interact with so many unique personalities, each child so special, parents so nurturing, and the staff so supporting. And again, that is Ellen Brady. Thank you, Ellen. Um, budget update? Uh, I think the most recent update I have is obviously you were in a meeting last night, or many of you were, uh, to hear the uh, town council 
uh, listened to many members of the public. Uh, it was a broad spectrum of events because they were looking at both the town side and the school side. From the school side, uh, there was a great deal of discussion. I, I, I would have to say there were people on different sides of the picture uh, that at the end, I didn't stay after the vote came started, but I did get results from Mike. And what I understand is at this point in time, there were six town councilors there. And I think I sent to you this morning that two of them are supporting a 0.6% tax increase. A third one is supporting a 0.6 tax increase with the statement that they probably will not vote for that 0.6 when the vote comes, but they, they were supporting that. Two of them were uh, supporting a 0% increase, and one tried for a compromise of a 0.3. Uh, Paul McKinney was not there, and so his vote will be extremely important when the decision is made what goes to the public as far as the vote is concerned. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, and I'll just mention it again. If, we, if at some point we go to a 0% tax increase, we do have approximately $140,000 to look at. However, I did not get direction from anyone on that. I'm not sure that you would want to give direction on that. And so at this point in time, we'll be waiting to see how that all plays out. And I will report just in a few minutes about also uh, the M MLTI and the discussions that we had today about the stimulus package. Any questions, Brown? I, I, I would just like to say one more thing. I'd like to thank each one of the board members who spoke last night. It was uh, your, your voices were well heard and well practiced and well planned. And I truly appreciate that. And I've had a lot of feedback uh, during the day from people who saw it and were very pleased with the comments from the board members. So I do appreciate that. Thank you, Alan. Insurance committee. I think that's me. <laughs> um, if you guys recall, during some of our meetings with the town councilors, um, it was suggested that a committee be established to look at um, how to study the health care coverage for our municipal and school employees to see that we're getting um, the best coverage at the most um, in the most efficient cost program. So the town council um, has established a committee to do that. Um, it's established that the Cape Elizabeth Employee Health Insurance Review Committee, the committee shall consist of seven members jointly appointed by the town council chairman and the school board chair. One member shall be a member of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and one member shall be a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Anyone in the business of selling health care coverage or currently working for a company offering health care coverage is excluded from membership due to potential conflict of interest. The remaining um, membership would be citizens who are interested. It's a, the committee's charge is to review the health care coverage and benefits offered to municipal and school employees. The committee shall prepare recommendations for opportunities for changes in coverages provided to employees, for changes in providers of coverage, and for employer and employee cost shares. The committee shall include an analysis of how any recommendations may influence the ability of the local government or school department to recruit and retain quality employees. The committee shall meet for up to six months and its report shall be submitted jointly to the Cape Elizabeth School Board and the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. The Town Council and School Board shall collaboratively review the report and proceed thereafter to independently consider the recommendations. Um, so given that, um, there's a member of the school board Anyone who's interested in serving on that committee, um, I will toss that out now. If there's anyone who's interested right now, or if not, you can let me know and we can pa pass along your name too for the committee. Um, I have a question on the intent of that committee. Um, is that committee's <coughs> intent to look at getting, and maybe I missed it, look at getting um, the same benefits at a better cost? Are they looking at restructuring the whole benefits program? I think it's, it shall review the health care coverage and benefits offered to municipal and school employees. Um, and I think it's, I, the committee shall prepare recommendations for opportunities for changes in coverage provided to employees, for changes in provider and for employee employer cost shares. I think the fact that they're looking for some recommendations on how it will impact our ability to recruit and retain quality employees. I, I interpret that to be positive, that it is, um, 
is there some advantage to sort of looking at this and sort of bargaining, it changing the bargaining unit um, or getting coverage for a larger group, which would be municipal and school? I think it's sort of looking at all of those things. And I think it is obviously with some costs in mind, but I'm interpreting that line as a positive, that we want to get the best benefits that we can in a cost competitive environment or cost competitive way. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Does that not answer your question? Or? No, it, uh, it, it sort of does. I, I just, I, I want to be sure that it, um, I just want to be sure on the intent of that committee and um, where they're headed. And um, just, you know, I, I think that we have contractual obligations and want to make sure that we um, uphold those and respect those throughout this process. I would think that that would be part of the conversation, but I think that's also why there's opportunity for school board voice on the committee and town council as well. So um, is there anyone right now who is interested? And if not, let me know, because we do need to put someone on this committee. OK. Uh, you know, I would be interested in serving. OK, anybody else? Okay, thank you, Mary. Sure. Pass along your name. Um, okay, Alan, community services presentation to finance committees. I think that's Kathy, am I correct? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Kathy. That's okay. okay. Um, the finance committee chair of the town council and I met with Janet Hoskins on <coughs> March 25th, I believe. And um, the, the intent of the meeting was that as we talked about budget and the differentiation between is it a school board budget, is it a town council budget, and where is it? So we thought what we'd do is we'd, we'd get together with Janet, and, and Janet provided, and you have in your packet, the, I call it the yellow and green thing. Um, and it's very helpful if you've had a chance to go through it um, because it differentiates between what are community service items, what are school board, you know, school related items, what are town related items. Um, and um, so it was very helpful. We also talked about after the budget season is over that we need, when there's more time after the budget season's over, that um, Alan and Mike and Janet and, you know, maybe chairs or whatever, we get together and try to work out you know, what is, make cl clearer the reporting structure. It may not be that there's a change, but make clearer, you know, which one's going which way. Um, am I confusing you, Rebecca? You have a confused look on your face. I just got something. I don't know where it came from or why I have it. Oh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so um, it was sort of a preliminary meeting. It was very helpful. Um, and I found that the report that Janet had put together was really good at helping to understand that, you know, community services goes in a whole bunch of different directions and does town-wide things as well. And I think until you look at the report, you don't re necessarily realize. You realize the parts that the school touches, but you don't necessarily realize the parts that the town touches, the municipal touches, you know, and those types of things. So. Um, I want to thank Janet for all the time that she put into the report and the time she spent with us. And we're hoping that moving forward, um, after the budget season, as I said, there can be some more discussion so that there's a clearer structure, so that when we got to get to budget, we're not going, well, is this our responsibility or is it the town's responsibility or is it a shared responsibility? Because I think that that becomes difficult for everyone mm -hmm. and if it's clearer. So Alan and Mike and Janet are going to get together and have that discussion sometime and, and see if they can't work out some of the, the little bit of bugs that, that might be there. So Janet, have I missed something? Um, would you want to add anything? You don't have to. I'm just saying if I've forgotten something. OK, thanks. Yes. Um, oh, ask green is town. Yellow is school. Blue is both. 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 Oh. Yellow and green. Yes. Oh. Green should be both, really. Yes. The yellow, and yellow and blue, blue make green. You're right. Green. You're, you're, you're <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Peter, whack her. <laughs> That's okay. Just give her a little hit. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Didn't Thank you, Kathy, for taking the uh, initiative to work on that, and I think that uh, will save some time for everybody in the future. Okay, laptop and computer update. Alan. Yes. What I've given you is a several, several pages from the telephone conference we had today with the commissioner. What I've done is try to summarize some of it. I'm not going to go through it step by step, but just try to explain some of the information that's on it. If you look at the top of the first page, and I might add there are copies down back, um, there were four focus areas today with the commissioner. The first one was the stimulus package. The second one was MLTI for the high schools. The third one was a revenue forecast. And the fourth one was Taiwan opportunities, I guess, for those of us who want to get out of the craziness of budgets. So I'll talk about that at the end. The first thing we did was the stimulus package. What we found out today is that the EDU 279, which is a GPA document, you know, that several page document, was mailed yesterday. Some superintendents had it this morning in the telephone conference. Unfortunately, we and others have not received it. It'll probably be here tomorrow morning. But that's the document that has the entire GPA information on it. It's the one we use as the basis of our budget. And so, very late, but looking forward to seeing it to just see what it does tell us at that point in time, which I am sure uh, will still tell us that we have a $504,000 uh, decrease in GPA. What I did was uh, looked at the stimulus dollars that they talked about for Cape Elizabeth because there are a lot of rumors out there. Uh, I had uh, con uh, information from one person in the community the other day that asked me why I had signed a uh, sheet of paper that gave me $1.2 million and hadn't done anything with it. Well, I hadn't signed anything like that because that had not come through. But I do have now a little clearer understanding. So what I've put in the box to show you is that the first thing that will be coming through to us is the 421000 and there was some odd dollars with that, which replaces, you remember that reduction that we were supposed to cover with $200,000 from the town and money from our budget? That money will be coming in. That money will be paid back to the state so that we don't have to take those monies out of our budget. So that's one piece that we're looking for. We are supposed to get it in early May so that that will be paid back. So that's 09 budget. And that's a wash. And that's a wash. That is a wash. Uh, but what they did warn us today, and I'll talk about it later on here too, that you remember the document I sent you that said that there's a $350 million to $500 million another shortage? Uh, the commissioner talked about that today. The fear is that there will be more money taken out of the 09 budget before we close the budget books. But what she did say was, that there is, they are planning at this point to utilize money that is set aside for fiscal year 11 stimulus money to take care of that so we will not be caught shot in closing our books for 09. Uh, she said that meeting with the state uh, finance people will be in the next two weeks and they will get the definite picture of what that looks like. But she said, I, I can't say to you that it isn't going to happen because she said, I'm pretty sure we will take another hard hit before uh, June 30th of 09, but that her plan is to cover it. Now, unfortunately, covering it with FY11 money stimulus means I won't be there for FY11. And if you remember the document I gave you the other day, she talked about the cliff of FY11. She talked today about that a lot, that we are going to see some many more difficult situations with finances as we start doing not this budget that we're finishing up right now, but as we turn around and start the 10-11 budget, that we will see those. Other monies that will be available uh, from the IDEA, we've talked about that before, the special education funds, that we are expected to receive 421,436 additional dollars for a 10, fiscal year 10. That will be combined with the 363,972 that we already get. And I know Dom is in the process, I think on Thursday, of meeting at the state level so that they can begin to look at how that money will be utilized. There are, with the stimulus money, some of the pieces that go with that is up to 15% of it can be used for technology. Uh, there is also uh, money to talk about as far as early childhood education. Uh, there are other programs within that. So that piece 
will be put together on Thursday uh, to see just exactly where we are with that. I think that was the first time today that Dom has had those figures have come to him. Alan? So, yes. Is there anything that would summarize for us what are the stipulations for how the IDEA funds need to be spent? I that's what he'll get on Thursday. It's the, it's the, stip the, the strings, the stipulations, the requirements. Yep. Am I correct on that? Uh, the next one is stimulus sta stabilization funds. This is the one that is, I think, was the 1.2 million that somebody asked me about. What is what was made clear to us when we got our initial documents that our cut in finances was really 1,204,459 dollars. The one 699,120 added to the 504339 which we have lost made that amount so the 699120 will come to us the 504 is the piece of the GPA we have lost and so that is from what i can understand is what the 1.2 million was nothing that i put my signature on but it was was the way the money was distributed if you remember i gave you a document from jim ryer that talked about it at that point in time and talked about the difference in the two. Mm -hmm. Questions on that? Yeah, I'm confused. We were cut <clears throat> $1.2 million by the state. They used $699,000 of stimulus money to restore okay. that funding back to the district, but we were still cut $504,000. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, so that is the way I understood it today when we got the report on it. There's also Title I-A money, but unfortunately we, along with Yarmouth and Falmouth, do not qualify for one a money as far as the stimulus package is concerned. So we will not be getting that. The other monies that they talked about with us today are the grant funds that will be coming up. Those have not been cleared by uh, the federal government yet but we will be getting information on those pieces and what they may mean for us. So as they come along, I'll be bringing them to you and I'll be bringing them fairly quickly because the time we receive them and the time they need to be reported on will be fairly short. And a lot of those grant monies they talk about are the type of grant money where you, you work with a group of communities to do that. Uh, some of you sat with me the other day in Mike uh, McGovern's office uh, where we had a representative from a local law firm who came in and talked with us about some of these stimulus packages. And my understanding is, is the town is going to commit to this person to help us through some of this so we can ensure we get the most money possible, which will be absolutely imperative as we move along. So those are, those are some of the stimulus monies that we are talking about. Those are what we know of at this point. And we spent a lot of time today on this conference call, getting that information and getting it straightened out. Uh, the other thing that I want to impress with you is the fact, what I found interesting is the reporting charge that we have. It is much larger than I ever expected. Uh, if you look on the first page again where it says reporting, and it talks about the assurances. There are four basic assurances which you have to give. One is on college and career ready standards and high quality, valid, and reliable assessments for all students, including ELLs and students with disabilities. The second one is pre-K to higher education data systems that meet the principles of the America. And instead of that being completes, it's competes. So take the L out of it, act. The third one is teacher effectiveness and equitable distribution of effective leadership. And the last one is intensive support and effective interventions for lowest performing students. The state in the beginning has to certify that these are the four areas that we will be looking at as school systems across the state. I think one of them that is, is very interesting to me and I wasn't prepared to see it at that point is the third one teacher effectiveness and equitable distribution of effective leadership. And if you go to the next page, it talks about under C where it says show how schools improve 
and help schools improve. It talks about teacher effectiveness and ensuring that all schools have highly qualified teachers. What I have done in the ones that most affect Cape Elizabeth is I've put them in uh, darker print and underlined them. Uh, so if you notice it says, we look at the number and percent of teachers and principals rated at each performance level in each LEA's teacher evaluation system. And the second one says number and percent of LEA teachers and principal evaluation systems that require evidence of student achievement outcomes. Very interesting process. I had, as a matter of fact, I talked with Dwight earlier today. And I said, I'm remembering probably about 10 to 15 years ago when we talked about some of these things and the panic that went through teachers uh, at that point in time because what it really, what some people interpreted it as is being compared about against other teachers based on the performance of kids in your classroom. I asked very specifically, what are you telling us we need to do? And what Susan told, told me and also the rest of them there is the entire country, of course, is looking at this. A majority of systems in the country do not have an evaluation system that has a very clear scale of success, you know, either using the 4321 or using percentages or using anything else. And so what they are going to be doing nationally is looking at that and will be coming back with recommendations either on a national scale or on a main state scale. But what it is going to mean for all of us here in Cape Elizabeth and the towns across the state is we, is we have got to truly look at our evaluation systems. Uh, you remember your, you changed the evaluation system, I want to say in 2003, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And so now we're going to be at that stage of re-looking at that and see does it fit the criteria. My, my assumption is it does not. And so we will have to move on from there. Alan? Yes. What is LEA? LEA is the local educational uh, oh, area. Yeah. Thank you. So that's Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Forget how confusing those can be. I went on and looked at the other ones. It talks about higher standards and rigorous assessments. I think probably that is the one we will probably find we are the most successful in as we look at it. But we are going to have to look at uh, our high standards and our rigorous assessments and how they work. And so that all comes under the curriculum, instruction, and assessment project that we're doing now. Uh, we have to look at intensive support, effective interventions, and improved achievement in schools that need it the most. You notice I did not underline anything here because this is really talking about those uh, districts that have low, many low performing students. We don't fit into that category, but we will fit into some of the questions they ask. However, I did mark here and I put in italics, charter school are going to again be revisited. There is no doubt Maine at this point in time has held out charter schools, but they will be revisited because it is a push in the stimulus package. So it is important that we realize that and that that is an issue that will go before the legislature, I'm sure, uh, in the next session. Alan, may I ask a question yes. about charter schools? Yes. What makes charter schools different than public school? I mean, I know that there are public schools, but they're, they're somewhat private. Yes, the way they are set up, they are not ma managed by the town. They are managed by a group of people who oversee the program. They hire the teachers, they set the programs, they do receive some funding that a parochial school cannot get mm -hmm. or other private schools. But what has happened is, particularly in states where there are much larger school systems, Boston, uh, New York, those types of places, they have taken the place of public schools mm -hmm. because there is strong feeling that they outperform the public schools. One of the issues that I found in doing research on the charter schools, because I did it for my, my master's plus 30 thesis, and one of the things I found out is their requirements for special education students are not as rigorous as the requirements that we have in our public school system. They must take some, but they're not as rigorous. Charter schools supposedly are also schools that take in students and they cannot be denied access there because of their actions. In a, in a parochial school, you can ask a student to leave. In a private school, you can ask the student to leave. Charter schools are, are intended to maintain students on a regular basis once they go there. The reason I think we have avoided it here in Maine is we are very small communities. Mm -hmm. 
and the, the pressure of charter schools would be very great. Probably the only city that could really possibly handle charter schools is Portland, mm -hmm. then possibly Bangor, and possibly, I, I, I suppose, possibly South Portland, although I think it's fairly small. But a charter school does have a different operating plan. Uh, teachers would find, if they were taught in charter schools or no charter schools, often uh, much less pay uh, because of the amount of money that is available for them. And there's also a tuition piece that goes with that. Okay. Now, Alan, don't they also have tremendous flexibility when it comes to curriculum? Yes. I mean, so it, they, they don't have the same constraints that yes. the, the traditional public schools do. So there is a, a huge benefit to them. Yep. Yep, definitely. So that will, be, that will become an issue. There's no question about it in states that already do not have charter schools, and we are one of them. Uh, they all talked about uh, information for educators and the public to address the individual needs. This talks about how we communicate in particularly the areas of math and ELA, which are, they see as the two basic areas, and how you get information out about how your students are performing. Uh, it talks about the federal reporting requirements. It talks about them on a quarterly basis, and they're very clear in saying it is quarterly and on time. You can't be two days late. Uh, there are award and award recipient information. There are project activity information. There are resources. There is an ed recovery team here in Maine who will work with us as school systems as we work our way through this process. Uh, but the, the, this is going to become a very difficult process because it's going to come very quickly and you must turn around the information very quickly. Now, I'm not trying to be flip, but they're sure. tied to me that are they going to be providing staff to be doing all of this work and reporting? I'm assuming the answer is no. No. What will happen is we will provide the information to them. Then they will have staff to pull it together to give it to the federal government. But what, what I ask, and so perhaps I was being flipped too, but I said, are we going to have a form that tells us what is the type of information we have, how do you set it up, et cetera? And she said, we would have that, and we would have this ed recovery team who would help us on individual issues. Alan, is a lot of this information available on our computer system? So depending on what you ask Gary and his folks to, you know, supply you with, you can fairly easily dump some of this information? Some. Mm -hmm. Not all. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays through. At this point in time, I think our major reporting issue is with the uh, IDEA as far as where that is and what information we have, et cetera. And Dom will be overseeing that information and how it is uh, managed at that point in time. What's most remarkable is that we are once again being asked to do more work and we still are getting less money. Yep. Yep. No, I, I would agree with you. and I. I uh, thought that, and I was interested, I should mention this, that the commissioner, I was on several times asking questions, and at one point, I uh, had Pauline with me to help me take notes to be sure we had accurate notes, and at one point, the commissioner did say to me, Alan, I have read your several letters, and I have looked at them carefully, and I would suggest you look at this and this and this. Unfortunately, my response had to be, I have looked at this and this and this, and it hasn't helped me in the least. So, but uh, she, she at least acknowledged that she had read my letters, so <laughs> it was there. Uh, the second part of this was the MLTI program, which is the high school laptops. Uh, what she did was she set the initiative and the reasons for the initiative, talked about the costs, and then on the next page, I asked her specifically, be clear to me, what does this all mean? And I said, in my understanding, what I'm looking at is I am looking at, I have approximately 550 high school students. You're telling us we have $242 per student. However, what we understand, we don't have our newest GPA document, but last year we were receiving, uh, what was it, 21 point, I forget now what it was, uh, a tw a tw a point two one oh nine. So in other words, for every $242 that is supposed to be in the budget, we received only $51.04 per student. <coughs> so we checked on that. We recognize that that $51.04 per student has been used in Gary's calculations for his technology budget within your budget. So that's where that's been used. 
So then I went to, okay, then let's talk about what I can take out of places. So we went to the IDEA. We know we could have 15%. We have a total of 421,436 stimulus money. So that would give us $63,215.40. We also know that at the high school we have 51 identified students. Each one of those students in the IDEA money is worth the full amount of the $242. So that would give us $12,342. So the total we would get with the stimulus money under IDEA, because we don't have Title I money, would be $75,557. Our total budget are the costs for us for one year, remember this is all one year out of a four-year cycle, is $133,100. So for fiscal year 10, if we were going to pay the first year in this, we are $57,543,000 short. Now, interestingly, the uh, commissioner had up today to be responded to by 5 o'clock a survey done on Monkey, we all know Monkey, uh, to tell what we are going to do. The answers were yes, no, and investigating. I used investigating. I put my details on there to say this is where I'm at. I am shot $57,543 because I lost $504,000 in the GPA. And therefore, at this point in time, I do not have the money to make this happen. Interestingly to me, between 3 o'clock and 4.30, I received two phone calls from people across the state who know me and called me and said, I hear you're stuck. I hear you're not going to be able to do this. What can I do to help you? And they gave me some suggestions. And I have phone calls out now to certain people who have control of some grant money to see if we might be able to get some more grant money. So tomorrow, hopefully, I will get more information back from them. But at this point in time, I have told the commissioner that we are in the investigative mode. I don't have the money. I'm at a, a 0.6 tax increase. That does not give me money to do it, and I would have had the money if I didn't have the $504,000 cut. So that's where I am. Um, did you get a sense of how the other schools were leaning with regard to the laptop in your conversation? From what I've been able to understand, and I also get this from Gary, because he was in an ACTA meeting mm -hmm. yesterday also, he said that there is a fairly large group of school systems around the state who are looking at other alternatives besides Apple. There are some that are looking at Apple, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of them that are looking at no. Mm -hmm. So one of, because one of the keys, and I think why we had to do the survey today, and that's why I'm going to be in Augusta tomorrow, is the legislature has to act on this. Mm -hmm. And they have to have X number of systems doing the Apple program in order to get the money that Apple is offering. And so tomorrow at 2.30, I will be in Augusta uh, to, with the Education Committee of the Legislature to see where this is going. And one of the people that called me today will be at that meeting with me as well. So we can take a look at this. But as I, I said to uh, both people who called me, and I've said this to Susan today, uh, we've been hit really hard in Cape Elizabeth. We are seen by most people as that very rich town, Cape Elizabeth. And I said, Please understand we're not. And I am truly struggling with this issue, as is my board. And so any help we might be able to get to at least allow the board to consider high school laptops is extremely important. And so that's kind of where I am with the issue as of right now. Ellen, is it helpful if um, you get out to the board, the people on this education committee, in, in hopes that maybe we have any connections to any of these folks? Is that I do have that list, and I probably should have brought it with me. I will say to you that the Education Committee is a, fair, a group of fairly new legislators, and none of them represent the Greater Portland area, uh, which has been before we did have Connie Goldman, when she was still in the legislature, was on it. Uh, I was trying to think who it was last year. But we had some leadership we knew. 
but it's a fairly unknown group. I will be interested in being there tomorrow just to see where they are and what they have to say. My understanding also is uh, from Actum and from some other groups I've talked with, uh, there are a lot of angry people going to be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this could be, I'm, I have a meeting at 7 o'clock Thursday morning in Augusta. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking clothes just in case I have to stay overnight in Augusta because this is so late. Yeah. But uh, it will be interesting just to see what the feedback is. But Actum has heard uh, that there are some really, really angry people. I can't say I'm one of the happiest people in the world. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how this all plays out tomorrow. Are they angry for the same reasons yes. that we are? Well, angry for the same, uh, angry for reasons perhaps not, perhaps they don't have the $500, $4,000 cut, mm -hmm. but there are other issues within this that they are upset about. Mm -hmm. And so it, uh, it is, and I, I, as you know, I, I have to be politically very careful. There were questions I wanted to ask today, but I thought I have every superintendent in the state on this phone line, and I don't really want to see, be seen as trying to cut their throats as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the people who called me today is very active and uh, will, will carry my message from there. And I would, I would like to say just a side note too, uh, I contacted Connie Goldman the other day about this, and I did not realize that Connie has given up all of the politics altogether. Mm -hmm. She has more or less retired, is looking for a new place, and with things that she's doing since her husband died. And I felt sad about it, but I also understood her reasoning behind this. But I think it is important for you to know, because Connie has always been a very, very solid voice uh, in legislative issues. And, but she has broken her ties with legislature at this point. Any other questions on the laptop? I wish I had magic answers. The laptop is a state. Program. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to figure, determine which one's state and which one's federal. Yeah, laptop is state. Okay. It is a state program. Uh, the third piece was the revenue forecast. I won't quite get a lot into that. I have reattached the document I sent to you the other day, uh, which is the document that came from uh, the federal government. Uh, it talks about the new forecast shortly. That's the forecast that says that we are probably going to lose more money in fiscal year 09. It talks about anticipated 9, 10, and 11 shortfalls. She was very clear that we want to expect uh, that, that uh, cliff that she talked about before will be 11, and that we need to really keep very close tabs on the finances that we have to move into 11 so we'll have some revenue. Uh, she talked about uh, the governor and the legislative leadership is committed to honoring the fiscal year 10 GP allocation, so I asked very quickly. I said, I know you don't have the figures yet, but am I assuming that what you have for 10, I can expect in 11? And she said, very probably, which therefore to me is a $504,000 decrease in 11 like it is with 10 in that process. Uh, the DOE has kept stabilization funds aside to uh, mitigate the type of situation we're going to go in. That money is FY11 money, and so it'll be used that way. Alan, yes. I just need to jump in. Yep. Um, I, you, sh I, you think that we're going to get another $504,000 cut, or they're going to maintain the cut at its current level? The funding will stay current. My sense was there's going to be a cut above and beyond the 504000 No, wait just a minute. I, I, I said that wrong. Wait just a minute. I, my sense is there is going to be another cut in 2009. Remember that first 421,000? Yeah, not, not in 10. Not in 10, at this point in time. Right. But this would be 09. So the original of the curtailment that we were told about, the 421, mm -hmm. which presumably we're, getting, we're being made whole. Right. right. She's now saying that there may actually be another number right. that is the curtailment. Yeah. And their plan is to keep us whole with money that has been set aside through the stimulus. Mm -hmm. With the next curtailment, you mean? With the next piece? If there's another curtailment for fiscal year 09, before June 30th. The information changes so rapidly. <clears throat> exactly. It's so different. Do you really have any um, faith that any of this information you're getting is accurate and won't change tomorrow? I certainly don't. My, well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you, Peter, because I don't either. I, I, I think it will change over and over and over again. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I think Pauline would say that what she said today, I heard a lot of people say, 
when you open up the phones so that people can yeah. respond, you can hear everybody in the background talking. Mm -hmm. So you heard a lot of interesting comments, but I, I heard over and over again, well, this is today. What will tomorrow bring? Right. So I think that's where we all are, and I agree with Peter. Mm -hmm. We just don't know where we're going to be. Uh, I, I think the thing that I am most interested in is the forecast that they'll get in two weeks and what that's actually going to say. They're predicting that 350 to $500 million shortfall. And that's a forecast from the state? That's, that's from the group who does our financial forecasting. For the state? Yeah. Because I think the state's bankrupt. No. <laughs> or close Excuse to it. Excuse me. Yep. So that's, that's what I have for information. Uh, and, and you're all exactly right. I could come to you next week at this time and give you a whole different set of information probably as we move along. Uh, the only thing I can say that at least to hear it as of today where we are is helpful instead of trying to guess what I've done for two weeks when I haven't gotten any answers. The final piece is the Taiwan opportunities. Why it was connected to this, I don't know. But it was connected to this and it was offering Maine teachers an opportunity to go to Taiwan to teach and Taiwan teaches to come to Maine uh, to focus on Mandarin and math and science. So I did add that there. Uh, just if any of you would like to go over, why well, I didn't want to leave you out of the process. So. Any other questions? Thank you, Alan. Any other questions for Alan? So we're no closer to getting any information about how they funneled, or how they funneled the money through and why other districts. Um, I, I think the closest I've got is this. It's happened, and we're not going to get any further answers. Now, I would say this, Pauline probably agree with me. We could get a shock tomorrow when we see EDU 279, but I don't think we will. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have not seen that yet, and we heard the discussions from the superintendents that did have it. So but there's, a, but there's, there's two issues here. One is the cut, and one is understanding why we yep. got cut and others right. didn't. I, I think we're all fairly cognizant of the fact that we aren't going to change the cut. But, but why? I, but I think that we can continue to pursue the why. Not, they can tell us into their blue in the face why we got cut. What we still have yet to even touch upon is why we got cut and Yarmouth did not. That's right. Yep. And that tomorrow, Alan, is the one thing is, you know, we, we can be the district that's not getting red in the face because we got cut. Can we please be the district that says, please help us understand how these differences are between districts so that we can plan better? And my, my intent tomorrow, I know what it's going to be like up there for parking, so I'm going to go fairly early. And my intent is to go to see Jim Ryer, and since he hasn't responded to me by email, and because Jim is the one who, whether you agree with it or not, is the one who oversees this, and he is the one that should be giving me the answers. Uh, and Jim will also be in the uh, uh, discussion, I'm sure, but I intend to get an answer one way or the other from him uh, before I leave tomorrow, so. Yeah, just to back, back, piggyback on what Rebecca said, and I think <clears throat> you've all said, there's no smoke and mirrors that need to be happening here. Hmm. A plus B equals C. Exactly. And if they can't explain it, that means that either they are attempting to uh, cover up what they are doing, or they don't understand it themselves, or they've plugged it into a program that's not working properly, right. um, which is, you know, could be the case as well. But if he can't explain, I took this number, Alan, and this number, this number, and that's how it came yeah, out, yep. Yep. Then, then we have an explanation. Then if we want to say, well, we're not in agreement with how you did it, that's a different animal altogether. But the explanation, and I think if we back down because there's all this other smoke and mirrors that's kind of happening, that we will wish we hadn't. And I think, I think you all know, I, I know several of you have given the copies of the emails to you. There have been a constant stream of emails yeah. so that they can't say they haven't heard from us. And so what I need is the other end of that. What are the answers to the emails as we go through? Right, she, particularly as we move forward to next year where our valuations have dropped and we should be seeing a little bit of easing of um, the curtailment. I would hate to see the formula change. I want to make sure we're stuck with the same formula. And, and that's another fear for me. She I clearly know. has your emails because she <laughs> said she got them, right? <laughs> we heard her say that today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Alan. Um,
Moving on to new business. Consideration to approve high school athletic fee position. I think there's just one. I have one. And if you remember the last time we did not accept Billy Brown's because he had to have his fingerprinting done. That has been done. And uh, Jeff, I don't know if you want to speak on Billy for just a minute, uh, particularly since I notice that this is marked as a new position and a new hire. Uh, do you want to talk? It's not. It's not. A new oh, it's not. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw the end, so I thought that meant new. <laughs> I'm looking at it sideways. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I move that we approve the high school athletic fee position as presented by the superintendent. Second. Thank you, Rebecca and Linda. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Um, consideration to approve the proposed school calendar for 2009-10. Do we want to table this because the policy yes. committee is discussing it tomorrow? That's right. Uh, well, I did ask John to come tonight just to give you an overview because I thought you did want that. And John is kind of the spokesman for the group. Uh, would you <laughs> mind if he just gives a brief overview of it for the board now so you'll have that? Nope. So. <laughs> but I would, I, as John comes up, I do want to say this. Uh, the, the principals and the assistant principals and the DLT have worked on this long and hard based on a lot of information we have received. John has been the one who's taken the leadership on it, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, and I did ask John to come tonight because I had understood when we had the planning meeting for this that you did want to hear a quick overview. And so I asked John to come and also to answer any questions you may have. And since Thank you have you, to do it twice, John, you can be quick. Mm. Uh, before I start, I just want to echo what was said earlier about the middle school drama. Uh, it really was a fantastic performance, and uh, uh, much like a high school play. And I think I'll, I'll let Jeff and Tom Lazat know that I had the, the privilege of walking through the doors this morning, and uh, the jazz band was playing. Mm. And wait till you get that jazz band, because it sounded like a high school jazz band when I walked in the doors this morning. So it's a, it's a real, real pleasure to see that, that happen. Um, as far as the calendar, when the, the district leadership team took, took the task of doing this, it was in January. And, and somehow, yes, I was chosen as the calendar chair. I think it was an act of collusion. <laughs> One of those where the entire DLT was asked to step forward and everybody stepped backwards and I was left out front. But, uh, I'll just speak briefly to the process and, and the highlights of the calendar, and then you can ask me any questions. I'll try and answer them. Uh, the process, there was, uh, there was original input asked of all the staffs in the three buildings back in January and February. That information was, was compiled, and there were four drafts made by the DLT, uh, one on January 15th, one on January 21st. The budget got in the way a little bit for a while. Another one on March 8th, uh, a fourth one on, on March 31st. At that point, we went back to the staff after the four drafts and asked for one more final input from the three buildings, tried to collate that information, serve the majorities as best we could, um, and, and look for trends. And the final draft that is set before you tonight should say 4-7, I hope. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Yes. And uh, it will be also presented to the policy committee tomorrow. Uh, some of the areas that I'd like to highlight as you look at it, uh, first would be uh, a late Labor Day start this year, uh, next year, necessitates an early start for us. So the first student day is September 1st, which is a Tuesday. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, teachers begin on August 25th, which is a Tuesday. And if you look closely at that beginning for school, for teachers, we have purposely front-loaded four teacher days at the start of school to focus on professional development directly in four areas, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and technology. Um, there is also a plan for a district presentation on the 26th by Dr. Ross Green, uh, Harvard psychologist. Jeff, hold the book up. Um, he's, a, he's a creator of a, a collaborative problem-solving approach to student discipline. He's the author of several books, Lost at School, uh, The Explosive Child. And uh, he'll be coming to our school to work with our entire staff and all three buildings. Um, there's 175 student days, as always. Uh, the, uh, the last school day, Monday, June 14th, or if you put five snow days on, that would be June 21st. Um, there are seven teacher days, as I said, 
K through 12. Uh, you just saw August, four of them, August 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, in an attempt to really go at some continuity uh, and, and also do all the things that we have to do at the beginning of school to get ready. It seems that we're asked to do more and more. So we really put four up front uh, to build some continuity. Uh, there is one on October 23rd, and that's the usual parent conferences full day, and that's K through 12. Uh, there is one on November 23rd for professional development, and one on April 16th. Um, there is uh, one building flex day on November 24th. So if you look at that, that would bring the teacher days to 183. <clears throat> and of course, don't forget that there's two personal flex days, which add to two more, which would bring the total teacher days to 185. Um, the pairing of the November 23rd K through 12 professional day and the November 24th building flex day brings back a past practice of upgrading families and students the entire full week at Thanksgiving. Um, that had been taken away the last year or two and it's restored. Uh, that was one of the things that was noted on a lot of feedback forms. Uh, early release days. Um, the high school uh, continuing and, and having very few. There's only one, October 22nd, and that's obviously for parent conferences. Uh, middle school in Pond Cove, K through 8, there are five. Uh, you'll see that one of them, of course, is October 22nd parent conferences. Uh, you'll see that another one is December 9th. That's a Wednesday. That is for a math workshop uh, involving curriculum instruction and assessment, grades 3, 4, and 5. And then if you look at the others, uh, January 29th, March 19th, March 26th, and May 28th, you'll notice that they've been moved to Fridays. And that, that is a new attempt to uh, try and see if um, having a full day on Monday, a full day on Tuesday, a full day on Wednesday, a full day on Thursday, and then the half day on Friday might lead to some more uh, consistent practice. I think that was, Jeff, you might have even voiced that idea, but it was, it, it came back in several feedback forms from all three buildings, and once it was put in on the draft, it was, it was highly supported, so we're, uh, we're trying to change that. Um, K through four early release days, there's three, K4 only, uh, September 5th, February 5th and April 9th. And um, the other major highlight is the change in start times. If you look, the high school and the middle school have flip-flopped. Uh, the high school will now start at 7.55, finish at 2.20, and the middle school will start at 8 and start stop at 2.30. So those are the major changes and highlights. Um, questions? Could we save our questions for tomorrow's policy meeting? Because I don't have the other, I don't have this year's calendar with me and I'd like to compare because I'd like to see what the, the actual changes are sure. from one year to another. So maybe I'll just save that till tomorrow. That's fine. Okay. I just have one comment because I will not be at that meeting tomorrow. I um, appreciate the continuity aspect of having those days grouped together at the beginning. Um, my only comment is the reflection that usually needs to take place at the end of the school year, and there's really no time allotted for that. So for whatever that's worth, um, I know we only have so many days, but um, typically, ideally, in the ideal world, you'd have about four days before and four days after. I know that's not part of the contract because it's probably too many days, but um, best practices would probably would benefit from not only the pre-planning but also the post-planning. Anybody else? I, I know there's legislation out there trying to lengthen the school year. Have you guys been keeping an eye on that, John, at all? And I don't know when that would be, you know, if they do pass that legislation, when that would be. I haven't heard. Okay. Alan, have you? Not, have you heard, Rebecca? It's not going to pass. It, it yeah. costs I was more money. Say, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would it's cost not us. Pass. It, I guarantee I, you. Okay. Maybe there'll if be a it conference does, call. I'll come and clean your mm. house. Okay. And Karen, I Thank appreciate you. your comments. I, I understand what you're saying. I think the effort to put them at the front was really to, to really get us some momentum started. And, and I love the idea of four days, so I'm not at all yeah. discounting that. I think right. it's fantastic. And I, and I, think I we, wish we had four more. I think. Right. And, and we do, uh, most of the teachers are involved in some type of professional development in the summer, getting ready for the next year right afterwards. So. I was thinking more of the perspective <coughs> of the work we're trying to do, the, the district work. Right. Yeah. Thank you, John, to all the committee that worked on that.
Um, okay, consideration of proposal from Cape Elizabeth High School teacher Lisa Mina Lanson to lead an EF educational tour to Europe during April vacation 2010. Lisa. Hi, Trish. Thank you. I'm Lisa Melanson, and I'm a teacher at the high school. Uh, this would be the fourth trip through EF educational tours uh, that I would be leading. So I'm here to ask permission to lead a tour for April vacation 2010. Uh, the travel dates would be April 17th. That's a Saturday. Uh, returning on, uh, I believe, the 25th. That's a Sunday. So no school days uh, would be missed. Uh, in the past, I've taken uh, a group to England, uh, last year to Italy and Spain. Uh, this year, this uh, Friday afternoon, we're leaving for uh, a Dublin, London, and Wales uh, trip. Uh, and next um, year, I would like to take uh, a group to France, Germany, and the Alps. Uh, I checked first with high school teacher David Peary because I know he also uh, tends to plan an every other year uh, trip to France, which is an exchange program. I said, David, would this um, compete with your trip? He said, not at all. It's a different type of trip. So I have his blessing to go ahead. We'd uh, arrive in Paris, uh, we'd uh, spend a couple of days in Paris, uh, visit the Louvre, uh, tour the Notre Dame Cathedral. There's an optional trip to Versailles. Uh, we go on through Burgundy to the Lucerne region of Switzerland. Uh, there's an optional trip there as well to Mount Pilatus. Uh, and then through Liechtenstein uh, to Munich. And in Munich, uh, there's sightseeing. And there's also an excursion to Dachau, concentration camp. Uh, and we finish with a walking tour of Munich and return home on the uh, ninth day. So it's a nine-day tour. Uh, this trip is open to students uh, in grades 9 through 12. Uh, they don't have to be affiliated with any particular language or history class. And I, I think that's been the strength of these trips so far. Um, if they have uh, French or German um, language skills, of course, they can use them. They can practice them. And I found even in Italy and Spain, my, my son encountered French-speaking people and tried out his French there. So I think if you have one language, you're apt to have um, foreign language, you have to be able to practice it there. Uh, let's see. The cost of the trip to students is $2,229. That includes the airfare, uh, accommodations for seven nights, uh, breakfast and dinner daily, uh, walking, tour, walking tours in Paris and in Munich, uh, a tour director who travels with us and uh, sort of paves the way for all our arrangements. Uh, what else? Uh, I think that's, that's what, and, and also any admission to any attractions that we go to see. Uh, in terms of value, ed educational value of the trip, um, I think there are ties to uh, many aspects of our curriculum. History, uh, certainly, world languages, art and architecture. Um, and I think there are connections um, to geography, understanding the world, and other cultures, maybe understanding uh, that the world's a larger place than just America. I, I think um, these trips are, are a wonderful way for students to mature, uh, to experience a little freedom within a, a guided structure. And uh, I've enjoyed doing them so far, so I hope you'll uh, allow me to do them again. Are there any questions or concerns? Do you need a school board chaperone? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll let you know. Uh, adults are welcome to come on the trip. In the past, we've had parents come along. It's a slightly higher uh, fee for adults. But, uh, Sounds great. Yeah, Sounds and I typically have had um, other chaperones besides myself. Uh, this year, my husband is going. Last year, my husband went as well. Uh, Ginger Raspiller is coming this year, and her husband, Ken. Oh, and our trip this year includes Chevrolet uh, students, so that's been a nice um, that's connection. So we have 18 students this year from Cape, eight from Chevrolet. Uh, one of the Chevrolet students is a Cape resident, uh, so a total of 26 students. So the trips have actually grown in popularity. I started off with a dozen each of the first two years, and now it's almost it's more than doubled. So. Um, can I have a motion to? I move that we approve the proposed uh, EF educational tour to Europe during April vacation 2010. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? second. Mary, mm -hmm. any comments or qu additional questions for Lisa? 
All those in favor? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I, I guess I asked the same question, Rebecca. The policy for second reading, the policy committee, have we reviewed these or are you doing those tomorrow? I think that we, it yes. got changed because the policy committee meeting That's got changed. Right. So I think we need to table the, this approval until okay. after the meeting. Okay, so we will table item D. Um, consideration of the proposed superintendent evaluation document. Linda. Well, the, the Human Resources Committee met um, on April 2nd. Uh, we finalized revisions to a form we started to work on last year um, and began working with in December before renewing Allen's contract. Um, Mary was kind enough to go through and do some proofreading. I do see that we do have one word that we need to correct in the um, form that was put in the board packet that got messed on. It refers to the superintendency, and we changed that to superintendent. So, um, barring that change, I'd like to entertain any questions, or I'd like to see if anybody had any questions other than that on the form that was presented. I'm curious about the superintendent evaluation timeline. Is this the timeline that we are going to hopefully implement? So this is customized for, for, us. for us. Great. And I Correct. noticed it looked as though it was in alignment with how we want exactly. to proceed and everything. And then, mm -hmm. um, so that's great. And then my next question was, there is this 360 um, self-evaluation piece. And I know that's, um, I think, an optional piece for you, Correct. Ron, but um, I would hope that th that'd be something that you consider because I think it's always a meaningful exercise to get Definitely. feedback in that Definitely. manner. <clears throat> Linda, um, this timeline that you have put together, is how is this different from the timeline that we had this year? It isn't. It isn't. OK. We um, did add. We did amend this to incorporate the school board self-evaluation, yeah. align it with the goals that we set at the beginning of the year for the check-in mid-year before we vote to renew the contract. It's different uh, than what we did. Uh, as you know, I, I had some concerns with the timing of, uh, of this process this year. Um, and it was my hope that we would have a significant change in the way we schedule various parts of this. In particular, um, the act, I, I would like to see us actually evaluate bef much closer to when we have the discussion of renewal. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that we're evaluating in June and then in December we have a 20 minute conversation around the contract um, so I, I guess I know I, I, I was under the impression at our January workshop that we were going to really try to undergo a, a change in the pro the, a change in how we organize the process not so much the actual evaluation itself because I think a lot that, that has been working pretty well but that the time, you know, the timing has always been so off. Well, and we had discussions on that in within the committee itself, and a lot of us felt also by doing trying to do a full evaluation mid-year with new board members also did not make a lot of sense. I mean, it made more but sense to align the true evaluation by setting the goals before the beginning of the year, doing the check-in on the progress of the goals in November prior to the vote to renew the contract, doing the full evaluation at the end of the school year. Didn't happen this year. No. Well, so it's not we're working. We're not at the end of the it, school year, though, well, this year. What happened in December was, is, was not what we wanted to have happen. And we were going to try to fix that. I, I want to make sure we're not having the same experience again. And I don't know if, if we're not changing the timeline, how we're going to avoid that. I mean, when new board members sit in December, correct? They're elected in November, they sit in December. So why can't we have a um, evaluation period that goes from 
Let's see, how would this work? January, just December to, to December to November or something like, or January to December. And we um, perform the evaluation in November in time for the conversation that happens in December as forced by state law. May I comment on that? My, my concern with that timeline would be for a board to set goals for the second part of one year and the first part of the next year. I, I think we should be setting goals for a school year, what we want to achieve. And then we come in at different times to evaluate the progress on that. And my understanding of this December date where the superintendent reports interim progress, people coming on board, there would have been goals already in place. We would be at least getting a report which would put us, I think, in a much better position to evaluate the superintendent prior to that deadline that we've been so sensitive to. I think you are absolutely right that, that that did not take place next year. I think we're wanting to make sure it does take place, so we're setting things up to make sure it does take place. That's how I'm interpreting this. I don't see a problem going January to December. It's all, it's all, it's all a year. Our goals don't start and stop in it's kind of an artificial thing to say that our year is September. We as a board sit all year long. We can have goals that go from January to December. Do you have a comment on that, Alan? No, I... Have an opinion on that? My sense is, is that you are my, you are the people who hire me, so however you want to do this. In terms of when you set the goals, though, and setting it from December to December versus a school year? To me, it would be easier to have it a school year because you have a beginning and an end within that one year. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's based on what the board wants to do. Didn't we meet in January as a board and set our goals? Because we had a new board that sat into December, we purposely waited until January to set our goals so we could include the new board members. So at that point in time, that's when we're setting our goals. We're not setting it in August or June or whatever for the following year. We're setting them in January. We did this year. Right. But, but, but in previous years, we have sat and done them in August yes. or early September. But we're always election. cycling through election periods where people, new board members, sit in December. And the dis discussion of the board was they, that we, were, we thought it was much more appropriate to wait for, for goal setting until January. So now are we not going to do that? Are we going to set goals in September this year and not wait for the new board? Well, we're going to do a check-in in June, so. Right, because we set our goals in January. I, I actually, I think Rebecca's points are well taken. I mean, is there any reason why we don't shift this from, sorry, now I'm contradicting what I just said That's three minutes ago, but I'm listening to what you're saying. I appreciate that. Um, is there any reason why we wouldn't shift this January to January? Is not just a matter of bumping the whole thing back? Because I think we did, we did have that discussion where I thought we had sort of written different dates based on that. So is this more in line with what had been proposed? How this other? What do you mean? I'm not following your question. Oh. As far as these dates? Yes. How, yeah, how do we select them? Actually, the original form we took this from says as soon as close to the beginning of school as possible. Okay. So we actually set okay. dates okay. rather than saying. I think what can, the problems lie in that board, the election in November and our renewal of the contract in, in December totally flies in the face of a school year. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Because I, but oh, I if we step I back and say this is, is an evaluation of the superintendent and typically his work and goals take place during a school year. Shouldn't the school year drive this particular evaluation? I can see that our evaluation would be different. It would follow our tenure. But if, if I know not all the goals are one year, but I think if we do two check-ins, January, June, or November, and whatever, June, it, you're going to evaluate him on what he's accomplished during the school year. 
I mean, I understand that there's a contradiction here, but I think. I can't support this. This, has, this process has not worked since I've been on the board. We have not had a well-functioning evaluation process. Not, not for any, no, no. You not know, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody not at all. It's because of this artificial time frame of the, of the state law requiring us to make a decision in December and because we have new board members in November, we are being forced off of the sink of, a, of our natural cycle. And I have been incredibly frustrated, as you know, <laughs> um, and it's been growing every year. So I have to say, I look at something that does not reflect any change from what we've been doing. I can't support it. I got to try, we have to, for me, I feel we have to try something new. But it also, this timeline also does fall, a lot, fall in line with his actual contractual dates. I mean, I, I agree with you as far as... Yeah, but his contractual dates have nothing to do with when we make the decision, unfortunately. We're deciding in December on a contract that starts and ends in June and July. I agree. So it does not, this doesn't work. Well, except so now something you said, just, and I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm not challenging per se, but if, we, if you're only doing a new board member, um, you could do the interim review in November when you have the board that's been has the information to perform the evaluation, then when you're setting new goals, the new board members will have been on the board for six to seven months and should have some experience to be able to work more closely with their superintendent to develop those goals and to perform more of a full-fledged evaluation than the November evaluation. The, the, the current sitting board has every right to evaluate the superintendent on the past year's work. The, the, you do not need to wait for new board members to sit, have six months of experience to then evaluate. No. Um, and I am very uncomfortable about uh, making a decision on a contract based on an interim check-in. I don't think any business would do that. What's the recommendation of the Human Resource Committee? With the minor change, typographical change, um, the recommendation of the Personnel Committee is to accept the documents submitted, including the timeline, evaluation forms, and check-in forms as submitted. Am I wrong? It's not the Human Resource Committee? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Did I say personnel? <laughs> we renamed it. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh all right. <laughs> personnel Committee. I'm sorry. Human Resources. Is it? It's the Human yeah. Resources Committee. Oh, it is Human Committee. Oh, I see. I got it. It is. I'm sorry. Okay. And it's Used on, to personnel. And it's on the docket tonight to be voted on. Correct. Right. Okay. Any other? Oh, we don't have a motion. That's right. Madam yeah. Chair. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the Cape Elizabeth School Board Superintendent evaluation as presented. Thank you, Peter. Is there a second? Second. Kathy? Okay. Additional comments, questions, discussion? I would just like to reiterate, I, I do share Rebecca's concern. And I love, I love this timeline in terms of how it plays out and how we would do it. I, ideally, we would look at it at different times to be for the same, for the reasons why we've had problems with this in the past, when we're evaluating, when his contract comes up, et cetera, it, it doesn't make much sense to me to do it the same exact way. Although I love this evaluation, and I and I get that, so I will not be supporting it because of the timeline. Is that the timeline? Uh, Any, I would uh, say, as a, a new. Um, board member who was, my first meeting was in, in December having to vote um, on a contract then it, um, it seemed I guess it, it did seem to be the timing seemed off um, I guess I wonder if there is an issue with this why we wouldn't go back um, into committee and take a look at it again um, it seems like it's just one month off um, and explore possibly changing the timeline. Question I have for you. As a new, com as a new board member, 
would you have been ready to do an evaluation of the superintendent at that point in time? No. I mean, I think what Rebecca's talking about is doing an evaluation in November, which would be or October. Which still affects the vote doesn't take place until December. So it still affects, I mean, that's not going to change new board members. Mm -hmm. It's no. not going to change the position at that point in time, except they'll have a completed document at that point in time. I don't think the law requires us to have the vote in December. It requires us to have the vote by December. So possibly you could have the, again, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Um, I, I haven't been able to think thoroughly through what would be my recommendation, but you could possibly have your evaluation in early November and then have the vote in November before the new vote <coughs> sits. Just a thought. And on that same thought, I guess I would be a little concerned about exiting board members with opinions at that point in time. I guess I, I hear both points also, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you perform that evaluation in October so that you can vote on it in November, are you adjusting the schedule of the goals? How do you assess completion of goals mid-year? Right. Because that's really what the evaluation is, is accomplishments and achievements of the superintendent, and you will be assessing them in October at the, or at the start of a school year. I mean, are you, are you, st you still are going to have a gap. You're going to primarily be reviewing work that took place in the previous school year. So either way, there's sort of a, a split. Can we change state law? Yeah, I think that's our only option. We've had so much I do that. I, you know, I mean, on that We've point. had so much luck with the state. Right. I, I, yeah, we should really try to do that. See what she thinks. <laughs> They manage school boards so very well. <laughs> now I see. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Um, we do have a motion on the table. You have a suggestion that it goes back to human resources. I don't know. Did, what, what is the? We should take a vote. We need to vote. We need to vote on the motion. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, any other comments or questions before I call the vote? OK. All those in favor um, of approving the superintendent's evaluation as presented, including the timeline. I think that was the motion. Um, all those in favor? Is that five? Thank you. All those opposed? Thank you. Um, Thank you for, to the Human Resource Committee for all the work on that. Um, consideration to approve the science curriculum learning goals is presented to the school board at the March 24th, 2009 workshop. We don't actually have a copy of those. We were presented, provided that at the workshop, and we discussed at that point um, about uh, approving them. So. I move that we approve the science curriculum learning goals as presented to the school board at the March 24th, 2009 workshop. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? I, I just want to thank the Curriculum Instruction Assessment Committee um, and the science team for all their hard work. I think it's really exciting that we're making this forward movement. And everybody's laughing. We're eating candy down here. Oh. Swapping it back and forth. We've important things going on down here. <laughs> as long as we're not laughing at the science curriculum. Um, so really, that, it's, this is great news and great development, and um, I am going to be happily supporting this. Thank you, Rebecca. Was there a second? Yes. Yes, yes. 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 second. Okay. Um, second. Any other comments or questions? I'd just like to echo Rebecca's um, comments and thank all the people who worked on that. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Okay, committee reports. I know there are a few people that want to. Do the gender and oh, the God, I keep forgetting that. Yes. Um, our adjustment to the agenda. I didn't put it. I wrote the letter G and then never put down what we were doing. Um, I had circulated to all of you, and I received some feedback in terms of edits, a draft of a letter that we would send to Commissioner Gendron and anyone else you guys would like to send it to, um, asking for an a explanation of the GPA allocation questions that we've discussed earlier this evening. Um, so I guess I ask if there are any other edits, if people feel that this is something that the board should be doing. Um, I definitely Any feel it's something the board should be doing, and I think it's a well-crafted letter, and I appreciate your taking the time to um, 
articulate what I think many, if not all of us, are feeling. Mm -hmm. I specifically like the um, last thing that Rebecca added on the bottom. Which was um, what? The accurately report this to our community members and local taxpayers. I yes. thought that was very well done. Right. Accuracy? Um, the state of Maine? Did you I'm, that? I don't know. I'm wondering. Um, <laughs> to Take the credit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do it. Okay. Well, whoever said it, it was lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if we should send this certified. Why stick it in the mail? That's a good idea. I Ellen. plan on carrying a copy tomorrow with me to read. Even better. Right. Better. Okay. As long as I was just waiting to get the approval. I'll have it put on uh, your stationery and take copies with me. Right. Well, that's what I was wondering is the signatures, but uh, since uh, I wasn't sure where you were going to be tonight on this, but I would like to at least be able to read it tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Right. Thank you, Trish. We give you Better. power of attorney. Power of attorney. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, should we, should we should vote on this? Yes. Yeah. Um, can I have a motion then to approve and to send with Alan to Augusta tomorrow the um, letter to Commissioner Gendron? Questioning the GPA calculations. So moved. Oh. Thank Second. you. Well, okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments, questions, discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. The second document we talked about was, um, and I guess I, after your conversation, I guess I question whether we still want to do this, um, was a statement on the laptop program sort of indicating it sounds like you've done some calculations since then. Um, this was originally drafted so that Alan could read this for, at the laptop to indicate that we supported, we, we, we have interest in the um, laptop program, but because of the EPS funding formula and our allocation, we really can't consider affording this. Is this something that we are still interested in doing? Are, Alan, do you get a sense that it's worth doing? After? I do. I do. A message from the board. No. I'm going to talk about the funding issue myself. So. Now, tomorrow when you get this um, GPA, GPA, whatever, whatever the form is, the three-letter form, um, it could change this. Could. Yeah. I doubt it, but it could. Okay. So you, you just, mm -hmm. you're, you're comfortable doing it as is, given today's date at 5 o'clock this afternoon? We, we could just say in the motion that um, we approve this to be submitted um, at the discretion of at the discretion of the superintendent. If should there be any changes in the funding formula, yeah, funding formula. But you know what I mean, GPA funding. It's late. Okay, I may move. move. I was going to say, do I have I move that we uh, approve the statement on laptop program with the understanding that um, should information arrive at the superintendent's office that would change the situation, he would not um, submit it. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second on that? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any comments, questions, edits, discussions? Okay, um, seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Okay, um, I think that was all of our adjustments to the agenda before I move on to committee reports. Um, and I know there are several people who want to speak, so I will just start down there and you can go around and speak for your committee. Anybody? Yep, go ahead, Rebecca. No, not yeah. nothing to report? Did you, you need to report? Out? Oh, sorry. Well, well, I, I have a several, which I've been a little, that's I okay. don't always take the time, and we're usually, it's usually 9.30 instead of 8.30. But um, I would like to give you an update on the CIF um, grants and just a few of the items going on with CIF is my role as um, school board liaison to CIF. The CIF grants committee worked um, very hard last week reviewing and listening to about 18 different grant proposals from the Cape faculty and staff. As usual, each grant was compelling and difficult decisions took place regarding staying true to CIF's mission while being mindful that CIF cannot fund everything requested. The 2009 grant, spring grant slate will be presented to the full CIF board, which is actually taking place right now, and the results will be posted on their website once approved. Um, it is always a pleasure for me to serve on the grants committee as a school board liaison to hear the exciting things that the professionals in our schools want to explore and take on to enrich, enrich our schools is definitely um, one of the things I look forward to, even though it's completely exhausting for two nights from four to eight or four to nine, mm -hmm. um, it is fun. It, there's good energy there. 
Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know that um, CIF now has changed their um, how you can give. Um, they're calling it targeted giving. And the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation um, has made this an exciting addition um, for accepting donations. Um, the targeted fund, excuse me, recognizing that many community members feel passionate about particular aspects of their children's education and schools. This change will enable individuals and businesses to have a role in directing how their contributions are used. While they expect their general fund to continue to support a wide variety of exciting grants, these new funds will allow for more dedicated use for future grant giving. Um, grant categories will be technology, math and science, teacher professional development, academic achievement, arts enrichment, and outdoor experiences, fitness and wellness. Additionally, they will offer their donors the option of directing the contributions directly to their endowment. Um, there will also be a Seif Pasta with a Purpose Spaghetti Dinner and Grant Celebration on May 30th from 5.30 to 7.30 in the MSPC Cafetorium, um, which is the night before the Pond Cove 5K Challenge. Um, so that's my, my CIF one. So now I want to do the teaching and learning one because we mm -hmm. actually had our first official teaching and learning. Oh, a question. Oh, yes. I have a question. I think when I read your uh, CIF grants that came through, um, and stop me if I'm wrong, I thought that there was something about hiring an individual for something. I'm not sure if it was a... Um, grant writing? Hmm? Grant writing? No, I think it was almost like a, um, they were going to be funding like an athletic coaching position, and I just wanted to be sure that that came to the board for approval. Well, and Alan, actually, um, we, we met again with them this, this morning to go over all of them. There wasn't one for, there, was, there, were, there wasn't was anything around athletics. The only thing I can think of that would be the debate. It was, it, was, it was like a stipend position for something, and I don't have it with me. I, I think it was drama. I just want to make sure that if we're hiring somebody for that, um, even if it's financed through SEEV, it has to come to the board for approval. Yes, I, the only one that I can think of, is that the Lincoln debate one possibly? I think so. I think that must be what you're talking about. It's the only one yeah, I can I think just, of. Yeah, I just don't have it with Because that was the one brought up this I, morning. I circled it. Right, I saw that and right. I said, ooh, that one's got to come to the board for approval. Okay. So I just wanted to bring that up sometime. No, no, and I'm glad that you did bring that up because I don't think that was in the back of my mind. I think I had forgotten, I'll be perfectly honest, that that's something that has to sure. come before the board. I know I sent all of them out, so and I'm glad that right. you took the time to read through them. So yeah. it sounds as though if that's something that we gr agreed upon and spoke to Seif about, that we do need to revisit that um, with them. Because an employee, whether it's volunteer or paid, is still um, has to be approved right. through the board. So as far as, pardon? Employee. Okay, so as far as um, handling that, Alan, you want me to get in touch with Christine about that? Well, I think, I think the steps were that, number one, we need to see if they're even going to fund it. Correct. And then we'll need to bring it back to the board at that okay. point in time. Yeah. That was, I think it was the late green, right? The one that went in yes. after all the rest would do. I'm pretty sure it's the debate stipend that you're talking about. So thank you, Kathy. Um, then the Teaching and Learning Committee has had their first meeting, and I, I sent out the minutes to everyone. I don't know if they, were, if they were posted on the website, and hopefully people had the opportunity to review it. Um, we met on April 9th to discuss the objectives and goals for the newly formed Teaching and Learning Committee that will operate as a school board standing committee. Um, the following objectives were identified uh, to work with the district's curriculum instruction assessment committee guiding development and review of curricular goals as outlined in the district's curriculum management plan or CMP consistent with the goals and objectives of the district to inform and direct the board's annual approval of learning goals in support of the district's educational mission to guide the board in periodic assessment of progress toward achievement of these goals to oversee fiscal and educational assessment of curriculum related goals and programs and to oversee slash guide framework for communication of and progress toward these goals to the public. Um, these items were discussed as next steps by committee members present and the committee members too are Linda Winker, Mary Townsend, Rebecca, myself, Trish was also there. The first one was to define a timeline to be approved by board for the CMP goals, and I'm hoping to have the opportunity to start working on that with um, 
Alan to then go back and present to the committee. Um, the second one to prepare a schedule for meetings slash workshops to oversee these curriculum management plan goals. Third one to formulate structures for workshops incorporating the CMP goals timeline and program slash resource assessment. Um, fourth, to develop forms for fiscal and educational assessment of curricular goals and educational programs to be used by board for assessment prior to and during the budget process. And I think that addressed some of Rebecca's questions, and I did actually download some of those, um, or you know, the, the template that you were talking about from Falmouth, and um, it's a good starting point. And the fifth one is to oversee slash guide framework for communication of and progress toward these goals to the public. So. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity for us to um, continue supporting the work that you all are already doing and to bring it, um, weave it into the budget process and hopefully we'll find that it's um, beneficial to, to all of us. And then the last thing that I wanted to report out on is the Sports Done Right accreditation. My head's going up. Um, which will take place um, on May 5th from 9 to 12, the several members of the Sports and Right Board will be coming down from Orono for a presentation and discussion with the CAPE um, Sports and Right leadership team. We will review our self-assessment, um, which includes our commendations and recommendations around the Sports and Right core principles. The Sports and Right Board members will then meet with Alan, the principals, and a school board representative, in this case, which will be me. Following this discussion, there will be a session with middle school and high school coaches and then a focus group session with middle school and high school student athlete representatives. At the end of the visit, the Sports and Right Board will debrief and identify our school community's strengths and weaknesses, concluding with a report outlining their preliminary findings. Um, embracing the Sports Done Right philosophy and becoming an accredited um, Sports Done Right school is a positive step in the right direction for our students and the athletic programs in our schools and our community. Um, there, there is a great deal, I should say, that we have already, that we have been doing well, that we will continue to do well, um, but we are, of course, always mindful of how we can improve. And I would like to take just a minute or two to personally thank um, the following people for their hard work and participation on the leadership team. I don't think I've ever read these names out, but we've had members, a variety of people serving and helping us over the past, I wanna say, year and a half to two years. Um, I will start, well actually I should start with those people who have passed the baton, who are not here, but Sue Weatherby and Keith Weatherby, but of course they passed the baton on to our, our new athletic director, Jeff Thorak, and our new community service um, director, Janet Hoskin, who have done a fantastic job um, helping us move forward with this, and they, had, they certainly had a lot on their plates at the beginning of the year. Um, our parent reps have were Cade Blackburn, our, our Mark Hare, Kenton Pierce, Colleen Tainter, and Chris Supple, and they um, were very involved and extremely helpful, and hopefully we'll have several of them there, or at least a couple of them there when the Sports and Right Board from Orono comes down. We've had um, several high school and middle school coaches helping out. Doug Worthley was very instrumental, the, certainly the first year, and very helpful. Scott Labby, Sarah Kinsella, Diane, is it Nicholson? Do I have that correct? Um, student reps were Michael Takash, Colleen Martin, Chris Burke, and Caroline Kelly. We had a town council rep, Jim Rowe, who was wonderful and came to most of our meetings and also had um, a lot of great things to um, a lot of great input. Community reps were Janet McLaughlin and Cindy Landergan, and we thank them, and former, um, and I just mentioned the former members earlier on, so I do want to um, sort of publicly recognize them for the time that they put into um, helping us through this accreditation process to, and getting us where we are now, so thanks. Thank you, Karen. Linda, I'm just gonna keep going down. Okay, uh, well, we do have an upcoming human resources meeting May 14th, we'll be discussing the board's self-evaluation at that point in time, if anybody wants to attend. Thank you, Linda. Kathy, I know alternative energy at Great. a minimum, right? Yep. Um, the Alternative Energy Committee, I'm a new member on there, um, the new school board member met on March 25th. I forwarded to the board this afternoon a copy of the minutes of the meeting, um, and it was, uh, very interesting meeting. Um, we received from um, Building Solutions a book um, at that meeting, and there is a book in Alan's office now. For oh, and right behind here. Alan, it, it's not in his office; it's with him. Um, in terms of a total 
discussion of a, you know, a huge energy audit that they did on the schools and the town buildings, excuse me. There is a proposal, um, and the proposal from them is for a, co a project of $2,663,792. Um, and if you go through the book, if you have some time to look through it, it's very specific. Um, the committee meets again on uh, April 28th. In fact, I have a conflict, so I'll have to figure out what that's going to be. But um, to discuss further, um, there were discussions at the committee level of how many, how much of these items might we do ourselves, um, and specifically with Ernie there and his group, and how many of these things that they might be able to do themselves. Um, there's a huge laundry list. Um, they are going to be doing a wind turbine um, uh, reading, I guess is what test. I want to mm -hmm. test. Thank you. Um, to see what kind of wind we have um, for potential wind turbines down the road. Um, there, it is, it's a huge laundry list. I mean, it talks about changing over the boilers in the schools. It talks about insulation. Um, the 30s building, which we know has new windows in it. The area around the windows is not insulated. And so they did um, heat sensor tests. And there's some pictures of those in here that show you know, here's a warm spot, here's a cold spot, and how they might address it. This particular group has some guarantees if we go with them um, in terms of how much energy we could save. So uh, I'd encourage you all to take a look at the book. Um, like I said, that next meeting is April 28th, which is our um, next meeting of our workshop. The meeting's at 6 o'clock. The finance committee is meant to meet at 630, so maybe we can talk about how that mm -hmm. might work, because I'd like not to miss, miss it. Because this, this was my first meeting, and I really sat on the edge of my chair the whole time mm -hmm. listening to what they said, because it was um, really good information. So this is a comprehensive audit of everything in the town, and um, um, it's unclear. You know, the committee, I guess, I'm not sure how far along they are in the process in terms of when they will report out to, I assume, the town council on some kind of a recommendation on where we might proceed. And then from there, um, I'm sure there'll be lengthy discussions from many, many folks, maybe, you know, public input and so forth. So um, pretty interesting stuff, and it, and it potentially could save us a lot of money. So. And I, I would like to add that um, the, the $2 million plus price tag, um, the, the hope is that the, the town could utilize um, some federal stimulus money in, from, in the energy area to help fund the cost of that. So yeah, They're not really there yet, but they're, they're talking, you know, they're starting to talk about do we want to proceed in this way and how are we going to do that? Are we going to use this company? Are we going to use it for all of it, part of it, and so forth? Because I think that there was some sense that maybe Ernie and his folks could be doing some of these things. Um, mm -hmm. But we have this, like I said, it's a great book. You ought to, if you could take a few minutes to take a look at it, it's really interesting. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that information. Um, about, uh, Mary, do you have anything to report on? Um, it looks now that the communication committee will meet on April 28th at 2 o'clock. Uh, we are talking about, we've been sidetracked a couple of times on meetings, and we are hoping um, to talk with um, various members of the school community about website redesign. Mm -hmm. So That was April 28th at 2 o'clock? Because yeah. that's not on our schedule we can add that on. Yes. Ignores the that teaching was just, and learning. Yeah, teaching and learning. May 7th at 11.30. Thank you, Linda. Okay, thank you very much. Any other committee reports? I think that's everything. All right, um, public comment on agenda items. I guess we will invite Dwight back up to the podium. So. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, <clears throat> board for giving me the opportunity to speak with them tonight. I have been reluctant to do so. Um, I am not a resident of Cape Elizabeth, but I think most of the board members know that I have been diligently attending uh, most of the budget workshops. Not quite as many, perhaps, as Anne Swift Kayata, but almost as many. And at last night's town, council, uh, town council's public hearing, we heard a poem, we were threatened with a song, and um, we heard a great deal about an impending train wreck. Uh, I'll be much less ambitious. <clears throat> I simply have a title for my remarks, and the title of my remark is uh, The Train Wreck Has Already Left the Station. As a teacher of history and government, I always tell my students that they must consider the context in which something is happening. People may have totally different views <laughs> of an event, an issue, a war, or a budget crisis, depending on the context within which they view this event. For those who are fairly new to the budget cycle in Cape Elizabeth, uh, this year may indeed appear to be a train wreck. Others may think that the train wreck is coming in 2010 and 2011. For me, for many teachers, and I think for many in this community who bought into the belief that Cape Elizabeth wants to be one of the best school systems in the state and the nation, the train wreck happened years ago. And we have simply been a doing triage on the patient, the Cape Elizabeth school system, for the past few years. Last year, this board and the superintendent did something that I thought was incredibly courageous and enlightened. <clears throat> you asked the administrators to develop a budget based on their estimate of what it would take to operate their programs in a manner that would truly meet the needs of all of our students. As I recall, uh, this resulted in a budget that required an increase of about 13% in spending. Now, unfortunately, this exercise was taken out of context, that word again, and you, the board, and the superintendent took a fair amount of uh, criticism, if not abuse, for doing this. But that exercise provided us with an incredibly interesting and significant benchmark. We ended up with about a third of what our administrators identified as needed. Now, I'd like to provide just a little bit more context. <clears throat> I hope everyone can remember that it wasn't much more than two years ago that the Cape was struggling with the question of whether or not it should merge with another school system. And you may recall that when we looked into this, or looked into the possible merger candidates, we discovered that they were spending from $1,000 to $1,500 more than Cape Elizabeth, and our taxes would go up significantly. Now, if you take the average of those merger candidates and you multiply it by our 1,700 students, you'll find that Cape Elizabeth is missing out on about $2 million worth of programs that could meet the needs of our students. That's also $2 million worth of tax relief that we've been enjoying for a number of years. When I look at the programs that I can't provide to my students, I see that as a train wreck. When I see a student in my classroom who is really having difficulty reading, I can't help but think about the program my sons enjoyed at another school district where they were given the opportunity to experience immersion in a reading program placed outside the district. <clears throat> I don't believe that would happen at Cape Elizabeth. When I see Mr. Shedd struggling to come up with a program that will identify the reading problems that we have observed in the high school, but he has to develop that program at the expense of an entire computer lab, I see evidence of a train wreck. Now, for years, <clears throat> we have been hearing the refrain, I just don't think we can afford that. You all know we've heard that. The only thing different about this refrain this year is that there is a really in the sentence, as in, I really don't think we can afford that this year. But we're also hearing a new refrain this year, <clears throat> and it is, there is no correlation between the money we spend on education and the performance of our schools. My response to this is, this works better as a prayer. We'd better pray 
that there is no correlation between spending and performance because CAPE spending is below the average for all the schools in Maine. Maine's average school spends $8,800. We spend $8,600. Now I know that some people in this community get tired of us being compared to Falmouth and Yarmouth. So I will compare CAPE to one of our other schools where our old friend Rick DeFusco hangs out in his principal, and that is Old Orchard Beach, which spends $9,300 about a million dollars more if you multiply it by our student population. Now, <clears throat> this is your community, and these are your schools, and these are your children. If you look at the budget process last year and the public hearing last night, I think it is very safe to say that this community is going through an identity crisis. It is having difficulty in deciding what its expectations are for its schools, and how much it wants to spend to sustain these expectations. Now, I'm confident that the teachers and staff will continue to do their professional best, however this community decides to answer these questions. But your staff cannot be expected to subsidize your schools while this debate continues. Which brings me to the question of if and how staff <clears throat> might be able to help out with this difficult budget year. Now the first observation I want to make is that the superintendent, board members, teachers, began discussing ways that staff could consider, I'm sorry, that staff could assist with this first gap way back in January. Without reopening negotiations, we identified 60 to $70,000 in savings, some of it contractual, that could be made. In the very first budget go-round, this saved programs and staff. Now we now have another $145,000 gap to fill, and I know there are some in the community who have asked, why can't staff do that for us? To explain this <coughs> possible impact, I need an example. And one of the grand dams of Cape Elizabeth High School has offered herself up as an example. And if you are watching, Elaine, I know Bill's going to love this. Um, let's look at context again. And I'm talking about, of course, Mrs. Brownell. Now, <clears throat> we've heard a great deal about the great salary increases some staff are receiving this year. But I want to put this in context. And I want to go back to the salary increases our friend Mrs. Brownell received in the two years before the current contract. And those raises amounted to $300 per year. That's it. Now, she was grateful, she tells me, but that, of course, did not come close to meeting any kind of inflation. Now, if staff were to make up this $145,000 gap, they would need to work two days for free. That's two furlough days. Because I think, according to Mr. Hawkins, it costs us about $70,000 per day to pay our staff. Now, <clears throat> if Elaine makes around $300 a day, not an hour, but a day, Mrs. Burnell would be giving back the equivalent of all the salary increases she received for two years in the contract negotiated before the current contract. Now, the cost of the average taxpayer, I'm told, is close to close this gap is about $27. Let's keep the math simple and move it up to 30. Mrs. Brunel and her colleagues can close this gap by chipping in 20 times what it would cost the average taxpayer to close the gap. Now, would someone please explain to me how this makes sense with a straight face? To the best of my knowledge, we have no illegal aliens teaching at tape. This means that your staff all have families in this country they all pay their own property taxes in their own community, and there is no reason to think that they are not adequately feeling the pain of this recession. We all know that Elaine is a giving person, but I would hope that enough people in Cape can see the absurdity of the situation that she won't be asked. Thank you for your patience and your consideration. Thank you, Dwight. Um, I don't see any other members of the public here.
make any other comments? Um, Just take the vote, sorry. <laughs> any comments, questions from the board? Okay, um, do we have any agenda requests? Okay, um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, I think these are on the website. We know that we need to add two, two additional them. communications mm -hmm. in teaching and learning. Um, any other meetings that anyone <coughs> seem to be? Okay, um, and do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Amanda. Second? Second. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh,